Now, very often you will also get the question or you want to try planimetry. You can do that in a parastonal short axis or in a parastonal short axis in a subcoastal view, but keep in mind that planimetry has plenty of pitfalls. First of all, the actual area you can measure must not be the area which is calculated because the flow, so the functionality of the valve sometimes a little bit differs to the anatomy, so it's not always entirely the same. Furthermore, you never know if you're truly at the smallest area which you actually want to measure or if you're in the correct area. And very often the image quality in such severely calcified valves is simply reduced. But in my point of view, it gives additional information. If you also want to get the feeling for the opening of the valve, you can try to use planimetry and then apply the gradients and the continuity equation because of course that you have to do to quantify aortic stenosis. But for the look and feel, it's very important to also at least try planimetry. But be aware it's not mentioned in the guidelines because it simply has plenty of pitfalls. Very often in a transesophageal study, it's also easier to see the aortic valve and do a planimetry of the aortic valve area compared to a transuretic approach. Same holds true, of course, for the mitral valve and mitral stenosis. Very often from a TTE approach, it's simply very hard to see and to differentiate. One last thing I want to mention is strain imaging. Strain imaging also holds a lot of information, or additional information in case of valvular pathology. Here you see that there are some regional problems. So the thickened myocardium leads to a reduced longitudinal strain. Here you see it's relatively preserved. Here you see the curves. Moving on to the four chamber view, you can see it here. The ventricle is truly severely hypertrophied. And you see in the areas more basal, the strain is more reduced compared to the areas in the apical regions. You see it over here with the curves as well, where you have the apical regions and the more basal regions. And in the two chamber view, the same is seen again, where you have here a reduced strain and here a relatively preserved strain. You have the curves again. So every curve, you can see the coloring resembles a segment of the myocardium. Here you have the strain M mode where you see that in the center, also here the color code in the center where the, the apical regions, it is more red and red means normal contraction. So a normal negative value, a normal strain. Overall, this was in the range of 12 to minus, minus 12 to minus 15%. When you take a look at the global longitudinal strain at the bullseye, you see that the global strain was minus 13.9%. Also in case of aortic stenosis, if it is below minus 15%, it's definitely also a hint towards that the patients need an operation or the patients need some kind of valvular replacement. Furthermore, you can see that this strain, for example, did show a certain degree of basal reduction and apical sparing. The apical sparing we do know from amyloid heart disease. And also in this case, it gave the information or at least the hint that this could be amyloid heart disease. That was ruled out before further treatment of this specific patient. So strain can give also a lot of additional information about other pathologies you might need to think when you are evaluating aortic stenosis. So I want to emphasize again, use strain imaging in case of or valvular pathologies and furthermore to quantify left ventricular function and to see that in this case the basal reduction in the overall of course reduced strain also points towards that this patient needs further treatment besides the fact that this is already a critical aortic stenosis.